Whenever you have plant material, you're going to be condensing it down, reducing it to what the solvents are taking out of it, and that could potentially be things like pesticides and molds and contaminants. Um, so starting off with the clean product is always the number one way uh, to start with clean extraction. Um, lab testing is the only real method of being able to tell if your product is clean. Um, whenever I go to new markets and new industries, like over uh, in Barcelona is a good one, people would ask me, David, what's the number one tip that you could give us to make great extract? And the first tip I would always give them is to test their starting product and the final product. Um, first, to make sure that there's no residual solvents, but also to make sure that you don't have the pesticides and different molds and contaminants. That's the place that you start. That way, you know that the consumer is getting a clean product, and really, that's the only place that you can start. From the base plant material, you move into the different methods of extraction. Each type of extraction has its own pros and cons when it comes to safety, both for what comes out of the plant material and also for the extraction artists themselves. So for the extraction artists themselves, um, when you're using different solvents, there's potential risks with, one, the solvent itself in contact with the skin, um, two, the environment, whereas if you can create any sort of fire with like alcohol or any sort of explosive situation with um, some sort of explosive gas like a hydrocarbon. Um, those are the two different areas. For example, let's start with the most controversial, the hydrocarbon, which is primarily butane and propane. The difference between butane and propane in this regard is primarily the pressure that you extract at. Um, or the potential that the gas can actually get to. That can actually change the, uh, the components on the extractor that you're using. Um, it can change the shape and the way it's designed. It can change the maximum size of the openings on the extractor. Um, and it's because the difference between butane and propane is about 100 PSI uh, in difference um, based at the same temperature. So if you're Running at a certain temperature, the uh, propane can tend to be, you know, up to a, a 100 psi um, more pressure, which means the in order to certify it, you're going to have to meet a much higher pressure requirement. Um, so when you have uh, an extractor that can do both of them. It's not the extractor after the fact that it can hold the pressure. It's not going to be the extractor that's going to make you safe. It's actually the environment that you're extracting in. What we call that is a class one, division one room. Um, what that basically means is that there's no sources of ignition, um, whether it be the lights in the room or um, you know, the, the way that the water is heated or um, any other sort of pump that maybe, you know, put outside the room and piped in. The ventilation is what primarily makes the extractor safe. With the ventilation, you're able to keep the levels of the evaporated solvent and the mixture of air together, oxygen, which actually creates those dangerous situations. Inside the, the extractor, you remove the air before any gas is put into it, so the gas is actually safe inside the extractor. It's whenever it leaks out that the potential danger for the extraction artist is there. So with that good ventilation, um, the class one division one ventilation, which is about one, uh, CF, one CFM per square cubic foot in the room, um, that uh, you know, is enough ventilated from the floor to keep the extraction area constantly uh, flowing with new fresh air so that you can't ever reach that oxygen to hydrocarbon explosive danger. So once you add that ventilation and you eliminate all of the ignition sources, you're left with just the fact that 
hydrocarbons can run cold. Um, you know, if one sprays out, it can, uh, you know, freeze your skin a little bit, but it takes quite a bit for it to actually hurt you. Um, so those are uh, the reasons why we wear um, uh, PPEs, what we call it, which is personal protection equipment, which uh, Bogart, we've been trying to push those standards in the industry. Um, one thing is that you wear cotton, um, no synthetic fibers. Uh, hydrocarbons, if there is some sort of um, flash explosion, it's, it's going to be not a fire, but more of a flash. So when you wear a synthetic material, um, that one quick flash could be enough for it to melt and to get on your skin, um, which could actually cause a lot more than the initial flash. Um, but if you have just a regular cotton material, um, it actually completely resists the flash in general and you won't have any burns whatsoever. Now these are extremely, extremely rare situations, but if you look at any sort of um, LPG industry, which if, uh, if you really look at it, hydrocarbons are used in our everyday life um, far more than any other gas, pretty much. Um, it's used as propellants in our cosmetics, in our food. Um, it's uh, considered to be grass, generally recognized as safe by the FDA um, in the United States, which means it's non-toxic. Um, so <clears throat> when you wear this personal protection equipment, you're going to create you know, an industry standard so that if there happens to have anything that happens, um, the extractor is protected. So just to review the hydrocarbon extraction, one, the extractor, when built correctly, can handle the maximum pressure of the extractor. That's what makes the extractor safe. Two, any potential leaks in the system um, are going to be taken care of by the room that it's in with the proper ventilation. That's going to make the environment safe. And then the personal protection equipment is what's going to keep the extraction artist safe from the little things like gas in the air and having cold hydrocarbons come out. You know, you have gloves on. And of course, um, for worst case scenario, the proper non-synthetic clothing um, on the extraction artist. So a lot of this also applies to alcohol extraction. Um, alcohol uh, can also create a flash fire situation. Um, a lot of the same precautions have to be taken with alcohol uh, that's similar with the hydrocarbon. Um, depending on the area and what you're doing with it, uh, you know, the regulations can change a little bit, but, uh, and sometimes depending on what materials you're using for like your gloves, um, you switch to something that's more compatible with the, uh, the solvent that you're using. Um, for example, PTFE is the most common Commonly used material uh, when solvents is present. Currently, right now, the industry standard is for parchment paper, which parchment paper is actually paper coated with silicone. And the silicone, although it's solvent resistant, is actually not solvent proof. So thinking about material compatibilities is extremely important. Silicone, in the end, actually doesn't have any place in the extract industry. Whenever you're using parchment to process your product, not only is there solvent present from whatever solvent extraction you're using, um, however, there's also terpenes, especially if uh, you're trying to make something that tastes really good because what makes the hydro, what, what makes the extract taste and smell really good is actually the terpenes inside of the uh, plant material coming out into that extract. Um, if you, you know, like lemon fresh pine salt cleaner, um, it smells really lemony. That's actually part of the cleaning agent inside 
of the lemon pine sol fresh cleaner. It's not just scent. It's lemonine that's actually being used to do some of the cleaning. It's one of the active cleaning ingredients um, in, the, uh, in the pine sol. What that means is that terpenes, which are found in all of the extracts and all plant materials, are actually solvents. This is why it's bleeding through the, uh, the parchment paper whenever you get some extract and you see uh, it bleed right through the silicone and parchment paper. That's actually the terpenes in the, in the extract eating through the silicone, reacting with it and breaking its sort of uh, non-stick, non-bleed through barrier and it's doing something that it's not supposed to do. That's simply because the terpenes and the silicone are not compatible with each other. So again, looking at material compatibility issues is also extremely important, especially with all of the new extracts, the super high terpene full spectrum extracts. Uh, those um, have a ton of terpenes in them and really they should only be kept in glass or PTFE. Uh, any other type of material has the potential to contaminate the extract and uh, interact with it at any stage of the extraction process. And this includes uh, all of the really, really good solvent lists. Um, rosin uh, is specifically is a great example. I see all kinds of rosin companies pressing you know, on their Instagram videos and you see the extract all beautiful and yellow oozing out and just the terpenes are, you can just see them saturating the parchment paper literally as it's being extracted. And that's exactly what I'm talking about with the material compatibilities issues. Um, when you have a really high amount of terpenes, which are solvents, it's going to interact with uh, a material that's not 100% solvent proof. So that's where PTFE comes in and solves that issue, whether it's for the hydrocarbon or for alcohol or for rosin and solventless, because there's actually a solvent in there. It just happens to be part of the tastiest uh, aspects of the extract. Um, so <clears throat> as the extraction artist, you have to also consider the, mat the material compatibility of not just um, the solvents and the personal protection equipment you're wearing, but also how the solvents and the terpenes inside are interacting with the materials that you're using. That includes the tools that you use to scrape, the extract off, all that sort of stuff. Um, this wasn't as big of a problem in the past as there wasn't nearly as much terpenes in the extract uh, that's changed over the years, and now the problem is uh, very apparent um, one type of extract that I haven't really gotten into much with the safety is CO2. CO2 actually takes place at an extremely high pressure. Um, the equipment has to be super overbuilt, thus making it extremely expensive. That's because a lot of the equipment can go up to 10,000 PSI. Um, whereas the hydrocarbon extractor, you know, use anywhere from 40 to 60 PSI is really where people uh, run them at, unless they're running super warm, um, which even then, you know, it's not much higher than 100 PSI at the most. Um, compared to that 10,000 PSI, if there were to be any sort of failure in the CO2 extraction equipment, it wouldn't be um, the in room in the environment that would protect you from that, the equipment itself, you know, that's just one of the reasons why it has to be so overbuilt is to help prevent any issues like that. Um, steam distillation is another one with really high pressure. And if you look through history, there's been um, some incidents with very large uh, steam distillers. So even when you're just using water and pressure, you have to consider the dangers um, for the extraction artists themselves. Um, so a lot of you know, the, these processes take place at really high pressures. So when people think that other types of extraction are 
safe. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways to look at it, and they can all be done extremely safe, just as long as they're done correctly and um, up to the standards and codes that already exist. Um, for hydrocarbons, even though it's a new industry and a new method of extraction, the all the regulations are already in place because of how much we use it in our everyday lives. People have it attached to their houses. Untrained people are going to gas stations and getting new cans, and it's uh, it's used in you know just the fact that you know basically you can compare a hydrocarbon extractor to a gas grill. Um, except you're not lighting the hydrocarbon extractor on fire. So, <laughs> you know, if you look at it that way, you can see that, sure, there's dangers there, but when treated correctly, the dangers are pretty much eliminated um, just by standard practices that have been created by other industries that use uh, LPG um, in far greater quantities and you know, in, in all sorts of different ways that hydrocarbon extraction doesn't even push it to those particular limits. Um, one other fun part to talk about is what differences do the products have? Um, you know, like a great example is certain molds and different things uh, tend to, when you go through the CO2 extraction, um, it's, since it's a warmer extraction, it can promote certain things like bacteria and uh, other issues that the plants, that the plant material may have. Sometimes it could promote that. Um, all of the extraction methods condense pesticides and, uh, you know, none of them pretty much avoid that, so that's why that's been such a hot topic uh, throughout the community, um, particularly because of that. With the hydrocarbon, it's a really low temperature extraction, so that has the potential to destroy or uh, um, any, instead of promoting the growth of certain issues. So the hydrocarbon tends to be a little bit cleaner of a product in the end. Um, as far as clean product goes, uh, there's some interesting aspects that we've really been getting into as a hydrocarbon extraction company um, or a manufacturer, and that's been the pumps that are used in the industry. Uh, right now, the most popular pump for both CO2 and hydrocarbon extraction is what you call a gas booster, which is like a big piston driven pump that's designed to be more of a transfer pump um, than even a compressor. And the problem with any sort of piston driven pump is the fact that the, the seals in the piston itself need to be lubricated on some sort of level. Um, this is just intrinsically part of that type of pump. So what that means is there's the potential to have some sort of grease, even though it's food grade, or some sort of lubrication of some sort. Um, for the first time ever, we've actually eliminated that in the hydrocarbon extraction industry by the use of diaphragm pumps. With the diaphragm pump, that's the kind of pump that, you know, if you're in the hospital and they're giving you IV fluid or anything like that, there's many diaphragm pumps that are creating those pressures and moving those fluids around. And the reason why that is, is because by nature, the diaphragm is a clean pump, meaning you can put fluids directly through the pump and they're not gonna have that potential to be contaminated by a grease or some sort of oil that's uh, making the pump move. So with a pharmaceutical grade hydrocarbon and a diaphragm pump, the hydrocarbon industry has a real good argument at uh, that it is possibly one of the cleanest methods um, of extraction. So that's really exciting for the, for the whole industry and it's something new that's been up and coming and it looks like
Did anybody have any questions for David? How can people follow you, David? Bogart.com, that's B-H-O-G-A-R-T.com, or at Bogart on Instagram. Also, Turp Proof for the PTFE uh, processing and packaging material I was talking about. That's TerpProof.com and at Turp Proof on Instagram. And uh, come and say hi, we'd love to hear from you. Is there a booth number over there, or you're just over there for the rest of the day? Yeah, I'm actually not sure what the booth number is. If When you go in, we're on the right side, and we've got our extractor out in front, so you can't miss Ooh, us. Perfect. I didn't mean to cut you off. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Just in general, um, when it comes to hydrocarbon extraction, you hear about people blowing themselves up. Um, one, hydrocarbon extraction should always be taken very seriously and it should never be done indoors. But what's happening is they're using, you know, the tubes and they're basically evaporating the gas into the air and it's creating these really, really dangerous situations and they're doing it indoors and it's creating these giant explosions. And one, it's making hydrocarbon extraction look extremely dangerous when you would never, you know, cook with a propane grill inside your house, you know? Yeah. Um, so there's that, and um, the solution to that is one, using a closed loop extractor and not having all that gas out in the atmosphere is really what, um, you know, makes it a lot safer. And then having that proper environment um, is the other thing that really makes it safe. So if you're not in a class one, division one room, you have to be outside. And just remember that the gas is heavy and it drops down to the ground. And if you're um, you know, keeping that in mind with ventilation, um, you know, that's, it's, that's the most important thing. So if there's a low, you know, if you, even if you're outside and you're in a low spot, um, you, know, you wanna be aware that the gas is heavy and likes to sit around. And that's what really causes, that's what really makes it dangerous. If it didn't sit down on the ground and it just went off into the air, it, it would be a lot safer, but um, the hydrocarbon will tend to want to stay to the ground. And so people being aware of that is, you know, the most important thing. But ultimately, um, everyone should be using a closed loop extractor and not open blasting. It's just not worth it. So. Perfect. And like... Uh uh, John Conroy was saying before, who's an advocate on our side, it's important to stay safe for ev everybody. It advances the industry and also it's better for personally, but also good for the movement, right? We don't want to be being unsafe. Uh, do we do have a couple questions now? Okay, perfect. Uh, so I can, I can just kind of attest to a story about why you shouldn't open blast in a residential area. Um, a few months ago, anybody that actually follows me on stuff will actually probably saw the photos, but I live in a 19th floor high rise and I'm sitting around on a Saturday afternoon and all of a sudden I hear kaboom and glass falling on my patio and on 10 floors above me, they had been open blasting and blew out the windows, the frames, the blinds, the curtains, the glass on their actual patio. Um, and I guess what the, the, the question is, is, you know, uh, <laughs> is there anything the surrounding neighbors can do if they suspect their neighbors might be open blasting? Like, is there anything, vent like, even ventilation-wise to protect themselves if something's going to happen? I don't know, because I don't know enough about this. Um. So, <clears throat> the, the, the real problem is, is that um, because people try to hide it, they're in, they're in situations uh, that are completely unacceptable and dangerous. So um, they're trying to not let the neighbors know that it's happening. And um, people, anybody responsible wouldn't be doing something Agreed. Agreed. like that whatsoever. Yeah. So um, the reason why it's happening is 
uh, just guess- a lack of regulation and a lack of um, knowledge and people being extremely irresponsible. And as the industry progresses, there won't be a need or a market for people doing those sorts yeah. of things. It's kind of a surreal experience to walk outside your apartment building and look up and see that there's, you know, um, if, you know, that there's been an explosion, there's, you know, it's not, not meth, and you're like, oh, fuck, there's no fire, right? Because, you know, you kind of, it was that moment where it was like, oh, no, there's no fire. Um, and that moment that you realize that somebody was being completely irresponsible with a cannabis product, which is supposed to be, you know, the healthier way. <laughs> But so I guess the answer to that question is no, there's really not anything neighbors can do for, to themselves to kind of protect themselves if their neighbors are doing something like that. No ventilation systems you'd suggest or... I mean, I yeah. would go talk to them yeah, the okay. first thing. All right. You know. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, thank you so much. We'll do one more question uh, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, thank you so much, David. I don't really have a question, but I have a story and I think I've already told you. About 15 years ago, a uh, person I was living with, uh, we encountered a pound of moldy weed, and the only thing that these people could think to do with it was to make oil. Well, the means of extraction was a honeybee extractor, if anybody remembers them. They were plastic tubes with a hole at the end and a, yeah. And a pound of weed was extracted on my dining room table with the only ventilation, the window behind, and the gentleman who did it was a smoker. Okay, now this is, and I have another street. Yeah, yeah, and this is, I have a, a, another friend, you might have heard about it, he's in Woodstock. Uh, he allowed friends uh, to process 10 pounds of weed in his garage, but, uh, if anybody knows the property of the gas, it's heavier than air. I think you've explained that. And it follows the path. If it can find a way down further, it will go. And his dryer vent vented into the garage. He blew his house up. <laughs> Lost a dog through that one. Spent some time in jail recovering from severe burns. So be very, very aware. If you think that there's any possibility you know, I, I've seen it happen. I've been in presence of someone who just had it happen to them. Like, it's not pleasant. And, and it, it can be extremely deadly. So please use every precaution. Don't do it yourself. Leave it to the professionals, please. So in 2013, uh, we released an extractor for $2,800 that the only thing that was closest to it was $28,000. And so we've been really trying to be part of the solution uh, to this happening. Um, we all love the extract that comes from it. And you know that's one of the reasons why we got into this was to be able to scale it and scale it correctly, safely, without people getting hurt. And those numbers, you know, um, are, you know, really sad and we want those to be completely eliminated and it's really crazy to have this stigma around everything because of not just a few people but a lot of people being extremely irresponsible and so um, we're working to put all of that way in the past and with education and the proper equipment and regulation. I was so. just going to say thank you for putting that extra layer on, taking the time, and coming out and trying to educate us all. Thank you so much. Uh, David Schaefer, everyone. Bogart Extraction. <laughs> and Turf Proof Packaging is bomb. I can attest. So make sure you follow those two things on Instagram and stuff. Thanks again. <laughs>